Hi everyone, this video is called Statistical Analysis and Data Interpretation. This video is in a series called Science Practices for AP Psychology students, and it is part 7.1, which means there are two lessons in this section about statistical analysis. This particular video will cover measures of central tendency and distribution curves. So let's start with the key focuses of this video. By the end of the video, you should be able to answer the following three questions. What is the difference between descriptive and inferential statistics? How do measures of central tendency help us describe data? And what can a distribution curve tell us about a data set? These are the essential concepts that I will cover over 7.1 and 7.2. In this particular video, you should be able to follow along and listen to the following concepts explained. Measures of central tendency, mean, median mode, normal curve, skewed distribution, regression toward the mean, and bimodal distribution. The rest of the concepts will come in video 7.2. So the College Board wants AP Psychology students to practice several skills throughout the school year, and one of them is data interpretation. So I included on the screen the skills that the College Board would like students to be able to do when looking at research studies in regards to data interpretation. So as psychology students, you might have been a little bit surprised by the topic of this lesson, which is statistics, and I completely understand that. But what you may not have known is statistics is an important part of psychology. And the reason is psychologists utilize research studies and many psychologists actually conduct those studies themselves. And when they are collecting that data, they need to make sense of all of those numerical values they collect throughout the research process. And to make sense of that evidence, they're going to use measures in statistics to help them analyze and evaluate their data. So statistics is a branch of math that involves collecting organizing and interpreting data sets to help better make decisions about that information. And this helps us create um, our understandings of relationships, patterns, and trends in the data we're collecting. There are two different types of statistical data analysis, and one is called descriptive statistics. Descriptive statistics are measurement tools that we use to describe that single set of data that we have collected. For example, if I am looking at my students' AP exam scores, I would use descriptive statistics like maybe I would find the average score, maybe I would want to know the scores that happen the most often, and those uh, summaries tell me about my own students' data. But I couldn't make the assumption that my students' data and the results and the summaries I make reflect all students across the globe who took AP Psychology. That those just summarize my students. But if I took a random representative sample of students and I did summaries of those students, then I could, the information I took from those students could possibly actually then be generalized to the greater population. And if 50% of those students in the sample that was random and representative, if 50% of those students pass the ex exam, I can make an inference that 50% of the population of students were able to pass the exam, and that is inferential statistics. So descriptive, those are summaries that just describe my data set, but if my data set is random and representative and it's a sample pulled out of a population meant to reflect that population, then I can make inferential statistics. So let's talk about descriptive statistics. As you can see in this diagram, these are the different types of descriptive tools we can use when we are summarizing data we collect. And that you are likely familiar with mean, median, mode, and range. And if you've taken a statistics class, then you're likely also familiar with standard deviation. Measures of central tendency, these are tools that help us summarize the center of the data, and measures of variation help us understand the distance or the spread of the data. So let's start with a practice example. Suppose a researcher gave a memory test to 31 participants, and these numbers represent their scores. Just by looking at them, it might be difficult to make conclusions about this particular memory test and how the participants did. And imagine if the researcher had collected data from 100 participants, that would be even harder. Measures of central tendency will allow us to make summary statements about this data and make better conclusions about the test scores. And if you need a reminder, the median is the number that falls directly in the center of the data set when you've ordered it 
chronologically. The mode is the number that occurs most frequently or most often, and there can be more than one mode. The mean is the average of all the numbers, and you would find that by adding all of the values together and then dividing by the total number of values in that data set. And here's just a quick tip. I don't want you to stress too much about the math calculations on the AP exam. You will not be allowed to use a calculator, so they would not ask you something you could not reason through or do in your head. This particular problem, though, you will need a calculator for, so you should go ahead and get one out. So take a second and try to find the mean, median, and mode in the, this particular data set and make sure that you reorder so that the data set is in chronological order. So go ahead and pause the video and hit play when you're ready to see the answers. So now you can see the data set is reordered, so all of the numbers are in chronological order. And now you can see that the median, the number that falls directly in the center of the data, is 5. The mode, which is the number that occurs most often, is also 5, and that occurred 7 times. To find the mean, you should have added all of the numbers together, and that would have given you 168. And then you should have divided by the total amount of numbers in this set, which was 31, and that should have given you an average of 5.4, so just a little over 5. These are the measures of central tendency. So this is what it looks like when we plot the memory test data. You can see across the x-axis is the points scored, and then up the y-axis, it shows the amount of people who received each score. If you look to the right, you can see n equals 31. And if you see this in research data, n represents the number of people in the sample. So in this particular case, 31 people were tested on this memory assessment. If you notice the shape of the data, it makes this um, high point in the center and lower on the ends. This is what we call a normal curve because this is what typically happens when we gather a lot of data, that a lot, the majority of the data will fall around the middle or the mean, and then you'll have fewer scores on either high and low ends. So what we just looked at was a normal curve, but data doesn't always look like that, especially if you have outliers who score differently than the majority of the participants. And this is a really great example of that. In this diagram, you can see that it represents family incomes in a particular city. Each figure on the diagram represents one family. Notice on the right side, it says n equals 30. So we have a sample of 30 families. The numbers that stretch across the bottom or the x-axis represent income per family in thousands of dollars. And you might Notice that there are these outliers that are much farther away than the majority of families in this city. And so this is a really great example of a situation where you'd want to consider all of the measures of central tendency, because if you looked at just one, if you just looked at the mean, you wouldn't get a full picture of what's really going on in this particular city. And this is what we called a skewed distribution, where the mean, median, and mode are not falling around the same number in the center of the data set. And this has occurred because in these family incomes, we have some that are making considerably more money than the rest of the people in the city. And so you see that the mean or the average is 140,000 in the city. And if you were to hear that, you might think, oh, well, most people probably make $140,000 in this particular city. But that would be a wrong conclusion because what has happened is our couple of outliers are pulling our average higher than what the majority of families are actually making in the city. Because if you see the mode, the number that occurs most often is $40,000. And the median income that falls directly in the middle is $60,000. So it's important that you know if you ever hear claims made about the average price or the average results or whatever the mean statistic is, you should always take into account that averages can potentially be distorted by outliers. So for that reason, it's also important to consider the median and the mode to get a bigger picture of the whole data set. Another factor to take into consideration when evaluating a set of data is regression toward the mean. This is a statistical phenomenon that occurs when you have a couple of extreme values in a data set. What happens is when you test or remeasure, sometimes that particular outlier will come closer to the mean. This happens a lot when um, testing in assessments. If there is this absolutely unusually low score, 
if that particular set sample was tested again and again, typically that will regress towards the mean. And this is just a phenomenon that we refer to as regression toward the mean when extreme scores, if tested again and again, start to revert closer to the mean. So these are different data distributions. You can see data plotted in the center is representing a normal distribution or a bell curve. This is when we've collected data and the majority of the scores are falling right around the middle and the mean. And then you have just a few scores who are scoring really high and really low, and it's created this peak in the center. That's a normal curve. Now you can see on the left and the right, we have two skewed distributions. This is where outliers have pulled the mean away from the majority of scorers. And so you can see on the distribution on the left, this is a situation where we have a couple of low scoring outliers here that have pulled that mean lower than the majority of the scorers. And so the majority of the scorers have higher scores than the mean. And this is a negative distribution. And I remember that because the tail that you can see is where those outliers are. The tail almost appears to be pointing left on a number line, which is negative. And so I remember a negative skew makes that point. You've got some outliers out there that are really low that are pulling the average down. Now on the right, we have a positive skew, and this represents when you have some outliers who have scored higher than the majority of the participants. It's actually pulling the mean higher than what most people have scored in that data set. And so this is what is referred to as a positive skew, where you have a couple of outliers scoring much higher, and it's pointing to the right, and on the number line, the right is positive. And so that helps you think of a positive skew where you have a couple of outliers who have scored higher than the average or higher than the majority pulling the mean up. So this is an example of a distribution that has two modes and it creates two peaks. Rather than a single bell curve that had one mode, this particular data set had two. And this is what we call a bi modal distribution curve, meaning it has two modes. And what you'll notice here on this particular example, a restaurant counted the numbers of customers that came into their restaurant at different times throughout the day. And they noticed that they had 18 customers coming in at noon and 18 customers coming in at 7 p.m. And that is what were their high peak hours. And so when you plot that data, it creates a bimodal distribution of two peaks or two modes. So this brings us to the end of the video. Let's do some review. I will read this question to you. Be sure to pause to determine the answer. And then I will include those correct answers at the end of the video. So question number one says, which measure of central tendency is most influenced by skewed data or extreme scores in a distribution? Question number two says, in a perfectly normal distribution of scores, which of the following statements is true? So this concludes video part 7.1, statistical analysis and data interpretation. Be sure to check the answers to the multiple choice. Also, double check that you can answer the questions on the right side of the screen and define the bolded vocabulary concepts.